Well, thank you guys so much for the opportunity to be here. I really appreciate uh, getting the chance to talk to you. I want you to know right off the bat that uh, throughout this week, uh, if there's anything that I can do to help you, uh, to be there for you, that I am excited and happy to do that. Um, a lot of times you might uh, just see me speaking in here or being totally silly eating meals with you guys and things like that, but if you actually um, want to talk about something or um, what, however I can help you, please let me know. Um, and I also wanted just to start out by saying thank you for the opportunity. I understand that you guys have the chance to hear a lot of important messages and you have the, the chance to, to dig into God's Word on your own. And I want to tell you guys that I'm not here this morning to share with you because I am wiser than you. I'm not here to share with you because I know more than you do. I'm here to share with you because I care about you guys and I want to see God do great things in your life. So I appreciate the chance. And, and with that kind of in mind, I just want to jump in. If you have a Bible today, we're going to eventually get to 1 Samuel chapter 17. So you can turn there now and kind of be, be ready for that. But I want to begin this morning just by pointing out something that's obvious and clear for all believers. And that that's, that's that we're people who are in a battle. You are in a battle. You might not realize that. You think you're going to sit down, chill and relax and just trying to stay awake. But um, life, this life that we live in the sense of our faith is often a struggle, a battle, something that, that we are fighting within. Scripture tells us in 1 Timothy, fight the good fight for the true faith. Hold tightly to the eternal life to which God has called you which you have declared so well before many witnesses. Ephesians 6 says, A final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. And 2 Timothy says, Endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Soldiers don't get tied up in the affairs of civilian life, for then they cannot please the officer who enlisted them. And so it's clear uh, throughout Scripture that one of the themes is that we are fighting a battle. This is common. We, we are um, in a struggle in some way for our faith in our life. And I want to kind of dig into this by looking back into one of the most famous battles uh, in the Bible because we weren't the first people to fight a fight. So if you guys will with me, just step back in time. Feel the despair, the heat of the sun, the cold sweat. Take a deep breath of dusty air. Listen. Birds are crying, armor is clanking, teeth are chattering, not from cold, but from fear. Listen, the deep rumble comes out. Will you cowards fight me? Where is your champion? Send out the one who will challenge me. Look, no, look up. The giant is stalking out between enemy enemy lines between our armies. He's taunting us. And this giant, of course, is Goliath. And we've heard his challenge for a long time now. We've memorized his insults. We know that he thinks that we are worms. And worse, we know that he thinks our God is a myth. He thinks our God is a joke. He thinks that our God is a toothless tale told to make Israelite boys feel better when they're afraid at night. Look at him. He is a champion. He's over nine feet tall. His spear could go through any armor. His, army, his armor is completely impenetrable. He is unstoppable and no one can match him. No one can even reach him. And all of us are bound to either die at his hands or to become slaves to his people. And he laughs while we cry. And he strolls around with confidence while we run with fear. 
Where is our champion? Where is our hero? Where is the person who can save us? Now we can see, as we look back on this very famous story of um, David and Goliath and what was going on uh, with, with the Israelites at this time, that they needed a champion. They needed somebody to fight for them. And the culture of battle back then was a lot different than it is now. Uh, they would have oftentimes uh, somebody who would be called a champion, which really is just this idea of a man who would go out and stand between the two armies. He would stand between the two, two camps and they would have one-on-one uh, -on -one single combat uh, just to see who was going to win. Each army would send out their best person and they would make an agreement and based on who would win would represent which army was going to win. And the idea is simple. Instead of these two armies going all out and people dying and, and just it being a, a horrible situation for everyone, each army entrusted their fate to one mighty man, a whole nation riding on the back of that person. And they would do battle with everything on the line. One representative to fight for everyone. And I want you guys to picture it. If you have a, a, your Bible open, uh, 1 Samuel 17, we're going to start in verse 8. It says, Goliath stood and shouted a taunt across to the Israelites. Why are you all coming out to fight? He called. I am the Philistine champion, but you are only the servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. If he kills me, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you will be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. And when Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. So why were the Israelites, why was King Saul chosen by God so, so shaken? Because they had no one who could compare to Goliath. They had no one who could challenge this experienced warrior who was over nine feet tall. Goliath was bigger. Goliath was stronger. He was better equipped. He seemed invulnerable. He seemed unstoppable. And everyone knew what was going to happen if someone went out there and fought him. There was no question. Goliath was going to win. There was never a doubt. He was going to prevail. No question in anyone's mind. And in the midst of this big na national disaster, a boy arrived on the scene with a load of bread and cheese, the Bible says. And he's kind of like the coffee guy who's, who's back from a run for his people. He's, he's brought sandwiches for the army. And you can imagine his experience. He's excited to see his brothers. And so, so little David arrives at the army encampment just as they're about to head into battle. He is, he is pumped up. There's drumming and there's shouting and there's the clank of metal swords and the mighty men are, are picking up their shields and lining up and they're moving forward and David is ready. He's ready to see God rescue his people. He's ready to see people in faith step out and, and challenge an enemy who's defying the Lord. But then it happens. Everything unravels. The mighty men who were marching out a moment ago turn into cowering little children. They're turning back before even a single sword is drawn. They're fleeing. Why? Why are they running away? Because Goliath has started to taunt them again. He's still going. And who knew that the words of a giant could turn back more people than his spear or his sword? And David is taken aback. He's shocked. He asks some of, of the people who are there who had been fighting for a while. He says, why, why is this happening? And the men reply, haven't you seen this giant? Really, did you see him? He's, he's big and, and we can't match him. The king has said that anyone who defeats him will be in the king's own family and the king will give him one of his daughters to marry and this person will be exempted from all taxes for life. That's pretty good, but come on. You can't use any of that stuff. You, you can't have any benefit from any of that stuff if you're dead. <coughs> And King Saul heard that David was asking questions, and he calls him into his presence. And in verse 32, we'll, we'll pick it up, he says, David says, don't worry about this Philistine, I'll go fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied, there is no way that you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You are only a boy, and he's been a man of war since his youth. 
But David persisted. I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said. When a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too. For he has defied the armies of the living God. The lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Israel had a champion. David stepped out to challenge Goliath, and the giant he couldn't believe his eyes. Am I a dog that you're coming at me with a stick? I think I'll just kill you and, you know, kind of feed your body to the wild animals for fun, for kicks, just because I can. Your feeble attack is like a joke to me. That's what Goliath is saying. And Goliath was obviously missing the point. And this is a point that, that apparently the whole armies, both of them, around them, had been missing as well. David would make this point clear, though. You see... Israel had a champion, Israel had a hero, but it wasn't David. Of course it wasn't David, that would be ridiculous. To send in a boy to fight this experienced warrior, potentially the greatest warrior in the world at that time, would just be crazy. As David walked out, sling and stones in hand, he was only a messenger. And this was his message to the Philistines. My giant is bigger than your giant. He would say, you come at me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies. The God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied, today the Lord will conquer you. And I will kill you and cut off your head. And then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. You see, David was no champion. The Lord was. And of course, Goliath must have laughed. He had been taunting the Lord for weeks. He was not afraid. He had all the weapons. He was huge. He had never lost. And furthermore, this boy seemed like he had kind of lost his mind because he said he was going to cut off, cut off Goliath's head and he didn't even have a sword. Surely there are limits to what a little sling can do. So Goliath moved forward with his mighty spear and, and David ran to meet him because he was not afraid. And he slung the stone and it hit home and it buried in the forehead of the Philistine's hero, and he went down. And stepping to his fallen foe, David took Goliath's own sword and decapitated him right there. And you can believe that the Philistines weren't so confident now. In fact, they, they turned and they ran. The Israelite army, the one that had just been cowering and their teeth had been chattering and they had been running away, that same Israelite army, led by David with Goliath's head still in his hand, charged after the Philistines, and they won a mighty victory. Where I want to land with you guys today is this one truth, and that is that our God, the one true God, wins. God wins. David didn't win the battle. The Lord did it. We have a God who never loses, who never fails. He has no weaknesses, and he has a perfect record. And he didn't let David fail. And no endeavor of God has ever failed. So if we step back onto the battlefield for a second and picture it again in our mind. Picture again what it was like to be trembling and afraid because a mighty enemy is threatening you. If it feels familiar, it's because we have all been there. I don't mean we've all been to Israel I mean that we've all had an enemy that was too strong for us. We've all had an enemy that we could not defeat. We have all had sin. We've all had Satan taunting us and saying, Death is coming. There's no escape. You are my slave. I own you. And there's no way out. And in David's story, unexpected salvation arrived. When David came 
With bread and cheese, no one saw it coming, and in the same way, our Savior came into a stable. David carried a sling, and our Savior carried a cross. And like David, our Savior defeated enemy, defeated his enemy, our enemy, the enemy, with his own weapon. Goliath had threatened David's uh, people, God's people, with his sword, and our enemy has threatened us with the fear of death. But just as David cut off Goliath's head with his own sword, our Savior used death to bring us life. Our champion stepped into the gap to represent us. He has fought for us, and he has won. And now, it's time for us to move forward. Just like what the Israelites did, the time came for them to move forward, and they did. When Goliath was defeated, they didn't just say, oh good, I'm so glad for that. The army that had been so shaken was transformed into a confident force, a strong group that overtook the enemy with reckless abandon. The battle had already been won when Goliath was defeated, and everyone knew it. And so they were able to move forward with confidence. They were, they were able to move forward without any doubt because they had seen the champion come through. And the same thing is true for us. Jesus has won. He has done it. He has done it. And it's time for us to move forward. We don't need to be afraid about wildly following the Lord wherever he will lead because this is his battle. Was it crazy for a shepherd boy to challenge a mighty warrior? It would have been. It would have been crazy if David didn't understand the reality that his God was bigger than the biggest challenge that could ever come at him. Fear debilitates us. It shuts us down. But as followers of Christ, we have nothing to fear. Our giant is bigger. And so my question for you guys today is, will you move forward and trust your champion today? Will you be somebody who, who lives your life for Christ even when it's difficult, even when it's hard, even when challenges come up against you because you know, because you know that your champion is bigger than any obstacle that you have. If you're afraid to let go of a sin, recognize that you don't have to be. Jesus has conquered that fear. If you're afraid to obey and to follow where God leads you, recognize that you don't have to be. You have a God who is worthy of following. Are you afraid to really sacrifice something, to give up, to follow the call of God? Recognize that following the one who wins guarantees that you will also win. Whatever you are afraid to do, whatever you are afraid about, whatever you are struggling with, recognize that you have a champion who represents you. One of the ways that the Bible talks about Jesus is it calls him uh, not just our, our champion, not just our hero, but our, our high priest. He represents us to God in every way. There is now no reason for us not to fully trust him, follow him, and live for him. In fact, in Exodus 14, the Bible describes God saying, He is a warrior who fights for his people. The Lord himself will fight for his people. And if you are one of his people, if you are his child, and the book of 1 John says that you know, we recognize the great love of God that he has poured out on us, that he has just overflowed onto us because he has called us his own children. And that is exactly who we are if we're in a right relationship with him. As God's children, you have a champion that puts you in a position to never fear. God has won. The undefeated champion is on your side. So fear has no place here. So think about what your life would look like if you fearlessly followed the Lord, your champion, your hero, like the Israelites followed David. Think about uh, what you, the young church, would look like 
if you fearlessly followed the Lord who has already won into every arena that appears to be contested around you? What would it be like? The champion has won. The opportunity is here for you to follow him fearlessly. One of the saddest things about the story of David and Goliath is that God's people for so long stood there shaking in their boots, trembling, afraid, because there was someone out there who was threatening them, who was challenging them, who was coming up against them. When at any time had they put their trust in the Lord and recognized that God was on their side, that they had a hero who will never lose, things could have been different. But there's something so encouraging about the fact that he used David, that someone who wasn't a mighty warrior, someone who didn't have everything all together, someone who, who hadn't perfected the art of war, God used him to win this mighty victory. And I would encourage all of you, I would challenge all of you to consider what is keeping you, what is holding you back from trusting God to truly be your champion, to truly be your hero who leads you in every area of your life, and what is stopping you from believing that he truly has already won the victory? Thank you so much for your gospel. We thank you that you paid the price on the cross, and we thank you that now we have nothing to fear if we are in you. We ask that you would lead us. We ask that you would guide us. We ask that you would deepen our faith and joy in you. And God, help us to see you for who you really are that it would change our view of this world because we recognize that there is nothing here that is hard for you. God, help us to press in close to you, to know you well, and help us to follow you closely so that wherever you lead, we'll be there as well. Give us courage to be your people not shaken and concerned and broken by whatever this world throws our way, but confident and joyous and expectant because we know who you really are, our champion. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray together. Amen. Thank you all so much.